I'm back at Classic Team Lotus for Brundle Behind the Wheel. And today, Chris Dinage from Classic Team Lotus is kindly uh, said he will explain the evolution of ground effect in Formula One through the late 70s and all the way through pretty much to the late 80s, understanding the challenges of the regulations, how they maxed out the performance of the cars and what Lotus's responses were to those changes in the regs. And we're starting right here, aren't we, Chris, with this Mario Andretti car? We're starting with the 79, the first uh, fully uh, ground effect car um, design concept. So the year before, the, the Lotus 78 um, uh, was was where the ground effects really started. But this was the one, once they knew that that was going to work. This was the this was the one which was uh, every detail was um, was de was designed about maximising the downforce. So uh, a pair of tunnels underneath the car, wing shaped. Um, so like a, an aircraft wing um, being reversed. So instead of providing lift, it provides downforce. And, and the, uh, the gap between the side of the, uh, of the car and the floor was bridged by, um, by a, a skirt, which um, I can show you how that worked. So this was right. literally to seal up the two tunnels underneath. Exactly. To, to create the yep. area of low pressure under here underneath there yeah and try to make the air literally force the car yep. down towards the floor yep and those skirts so seal it tight we pull that pin out of there and the skirt would be down on the floor when the when the tires are on the car that's in contact with the floor for the duration of the of the lap so the skirt literally was on a on a runner that fully yep. sealed the floor has a ceramic edge on it to stop it wearing out and that's where it sat for the whole race. So that then looks a little bit trick and was presumably not allowed then after that. Uh, no, that was, uh, that, that was all completely legal. Um, and the, the, the 79 really was the car that was above everything else. People copied it, but because the concept of their design, the bottom of the, the, sh the chassis sh is wedge shaped as well. So that gives um, more opportunity for, 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 for bigger tunnels whereas conventionally the tubs would have been flat sided. So we had a year in 1978 where this really was the dominant car um, and it, uh, it took till the following year for people to catch up with that, at which time we'd taken the uh, ground effect to the next level with the Lotus 80, which is the yeah. Martini racing car um, that you can see there. The idea behind that one was Again, maximising the aerodynamics. Yeah. The back end of the car was um, coke bottle shaped. Let's go and have a look. Which at it, was a, again another. Th um, so this was this was the year of your first race, wasn't it, with with Lotus? This, this was the year that I first went to a Grand Prix. I okay. wasn't working here at that time. Okay. But I was. Uh, I, I witnessed the first Grand Prix in uh, in Zolder, the first win. And um, I went to the Dutch Grand Prix as well that year. As, as a 16, 17 year old uh, enthusiast, thinking that's what I want to do one day. So the longest, you were telling me, the longest piece of bodywork in Formula in F1 history, history. Is, is right there. So got all the way from the front to the back. And when the, the concept of this car was to run with no wings, um, because the tunnels are much more efficient, um, so there's more downforce for less drag. Um, as soon as you put a wing with any ink, angle on it you start in, in increasing the drag so the, the original design this car had no wings it relied solely on the underfloor uh, to generate its downforce and coke bottle shape as well to try and influence the speed of the air under the car even more um, unfortunately it never worked um, it was one step too far and um, uh, it was only raced three times. Mario raced it three times, and uh, and then him and uh, Carlos Reutemann at the time decided it would be better to go back to um, the 79. So, what was the problem with the design then? What what did it what did the car behave like? There was a lot of porpoising going on. The, the um, bouncing the against bouncing the floor. The bouncing against the floor yeah. of the car, and the um, and the skirts. It was another uh, innovation. The skirts weren't straight; they were curved. So there was it was really difficult to stop them sticking. So they would they would follow the course of the of, of, the, of the circuit, but there would be occasions where once when they rose that they would lose that momentarily, 
just m lose that contact with the ground and then <laughs> the effect on the downforce is just significant. So presumably you then immediately lose a massive amount of downforce exactly. and, and spin off. And run the risk of spinning off, yeah. Yeah. So this design completely didn't work? No. Or back then? Back to that for the remainder of 1979. Um, and then in 1980, um, the Colin Chapman brief was to make something simple. Let's go back to getting a simple car. Um, so the, uh, the Essex livery 81 was raced in, in 1980. Um, and then the next change in rules then was that they banned the sliding skirts. So you had to have a ground clearance um, with the car in 1981. And the initial way around that was to put some hydraulic um, uh, units on each spring. So once the car left the pit lane and, and cleared the 40 mil ride height control, um, you, a, a switch dumped some fluid out of the reservoirs <laughs> and the car went down. So we had skirts back on the ground again. So any way to get any those way skirts to get as close to the floor as possible, seal most, up the tunnel. Most important thing. Yeah. So, Most important thing. So what came next then? What's the next iteration of car that we've got here to, to show? Well, after they banned the hydraulic lowering of the car, um, the next thing that, that, um, that we did was we, we preloaded the skirts into the ground before it left the pit lane. So the car was jacked up, the panels were screwed on, and as we let the car down, it folded the skirt material into the floor. So that was, uh, that was the next way around skirting around the rules. So then at the end of 1982, the rule makes that enough's enough. We've got turbo engines coming into Formula One, which is gonna be even more horsepower. The risks of um, skirt damage and failure um, and, and, and loss of downforce was, was the, the risks were, were, were growing up for big, big accidents and big offs. So Lotus 81, is done. The, the hydraulic system to, to lower the car is, is outlawed. How are we going to get around the rules next uh, to get those tunnels nice and close to the floor? That's where the twin chassis car comes in. So this was a concept where in the rule book, the, the, um, it, it, it says about the chassis in Formula One, the plural of chassis is chassis. So it doesn't say in the rule book that you can't have two of them. So we had the conventional um, primary chassis um, which the driver sat in, which had normal sprung parts of the car. And then the bodywork was actually the second chassis um, and it was completely encased with it. So in the pits, it had 40 mil ground clearance. Um, once it went out on track, it was mounted on um, some gas trucks, which compressed, which put the skirts back into contact with the ground. All the downforce was produced by the entire bodywork. Uh, transmitted through these struts straight into the upright. But that really is another story. Not that was allowed. outlawed again. Um, and we arrive here at, at the... Uh, the at Lotus the 91. Yeah, the 82 car, the final ground effect car. Yeah. So this is really, this is really it. They've, so they've taken away the ability to, to float the skirts. You have to run fixed skirts alongside yep. a raft of other regulations. Take, take me through this beast. Where does its performance come from uh, and what was it like to, to, to work with and drive? Well, the performance again comes from sealing that gap. So um, the rules had changed again where the, you were allowed to seal the gap but with fixed skirts. Um, what that resulted in is was with, with cars which were incredibly stiff. So this was running two and a half thousand pound springs. Um, and what we didn't know at the time was actually the, the suspension itself deflected more than the spring did. They were so stiff. So essentially the car, as it sits, is pretty much locked solid. solid. Yeah. We didn't need front wings on it in most of the circuits because the, the, it generated so much downforce um, without them. It had relatively small rear wings, um, but it was a huge, big, solid, almost like a giant go-kart. So it was extremely difficult to drive. Um, it was very heavy to drive um, uh, and um, at the end of that year they realised that you know, something's got to change because there's more power coming into Formula One with the turbo engine era um, starting to accelerate and at the end of 82 they said no more ground effects, you've got to have flat bottoms. So flat bottom floors, 
uh, a whole new raft of drivers. A young A Senna uh, is in Formula One at this time and ends up driving for a uh, iconic uh, gold and black Lotus team. Uh, let's go and have a look at his motor, shall we? Okay. So the, the 82 car now defunct, the flat bottom floor has, uh, has started in 1983. Uh, what does that then mean for Lotus, bringing us through to, to this beast we're standing in front of now? Well, we were in a transitional period because we were, again, one of Lotus first. We went out to find a turbo engine. You know, we've been running Cosworths for all those years and we needed more power. So um, we went to Renault to get a turbo engine. Um, they used much more fuel. So we designed the Type 93. Um, and the rules changed as well with, with um, no ground effects and flat bottom. So we had a big job on and probably missed the boat a little bit. The car we designed was big compared with our competitors. How much fuel did you have to carry then at I the start of each Grand Prix? something like 220 litres you needed for a turbo car. It was a huge massive amount, amount, massive amount. Um, so along with that, we were running the first active Formula One car as well, we were investigating that, albeit with the Cosworth engine. So we had an awful lot going on over that transitional period and we kind of, we didn't maximize um, what we could have perhaps in terms of design. So with Nigel Mansell and Elio De Angelis driving in 83, the beginning of that year was very difficult and Gerard Ducarouge arrived and he said, we're gonna get rid of those, both those cars. We'll take two cars from the collection from the ground effect era and we'll use their chassis none of the bodywork we made a new gearbox coupled it to the the, the previous year's sh carbon chassis put some refueling fittings in it and that was it and that's what we went and raced with and we it's it somehow in six weeks and i still i still don't understand how we managed to do that but in six weeks we produced the 94 which was a really competitive car. Unfortunately, the reliability um, was what let us down. But we, uh, we went from really being close to the back of the grid to having a black front row at the brand's hat. So things had moved on. Now we got a good designer, we got good engine, we got good everything. We were, we were, we were coming back um, as, a, as, a, as a force. Um, and the following year was another improvement in 1984 with the same drivers. And then in 1985, Mansell left to go to Williams and um, Elio's new teammate was Ayrton Senna. So you arrive here, flat bottom, but much bigger wings on the car yep. to, to compensate. Early barge boards as well, yes. uh, which have been uh, taken out of Formula One uh, for, for this year. That's, tell you what, they've stood the test of time, haven't they? they that have. little barge board structure. An another Lotus first as well. Exactly, Some, a, 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 a design item that, that very much came from Lotus. These cars were much, much different to, to engineer and to drive, weren't they? From, yeah. from you know, yeah. without having to maximize that ground effect and that, but having the wings to use. Yeah, the thing with the ground effects cars, they were quite consistent all the time that the skirts were sealing the gap. Um, but with the flat bottom era, that introduced a whole new raft of issues. Um, the, the really the really quick and nimble cars, but especially in 83 with the, with the Williams and the Brabham and the Tyrrell, which were delta shaped, they didn't carry this big footprint of the car. The footprint made the cars really pitch sensitive. So as soon as you put the brakes or the throttle on, when the car changed its attitude, the, 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 the center of pressure point moved all over the place. It was really, really difficult to control. And um, so that made them really difficult to drive, especially coupled with 700 plus horsepower. Um, uh, and that's just in race trim when it came to qualifying. Um, then it exaggerated the problem because there was even more horsepower. Uh, the very much uh, the master of these things was Ayrton Senna. Was it, was it special to work with him it, with these cars? It was really special. He's such an intelligent man. Take away the racing aspect. I don't think I've met anyone who had, um, who had his capacity to absorb information. So he'd spend 50% of his ability driving the car quicker than anybody else. And the other 50%, he just knew what was happening around him in the pits, 
on the back straight, through the corners. He just had so much awareness um, of everything that was going on, on around him. An exceptional man. From skirts, moving up and down, sealing the floor, to all of the different innovations uh, and operations to try to regain uh, that benefit. To this, the entire concept band, the wings uh, on the car, the barge boards working the air around the wheels and the master at work behind the steering wheel. Thank you so much for taking us through the, the evolution of ground effect in Formula One.